Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at the projection method of hydrostatics. The reason we need the projection method is because occasionally we run into curved surfaces. And your first reaction may be that we've done curved surfaces before. After all, we've done work on circles and on other things like that. Um, but remember that those were circles that were inscribed on flat plates. Hopefully it's clear that the force is going to have both X and Y components. So this is our resultant force and it's going to be a vector. Now, hopefully your first thought whenever you see a vector where we don't know exactly what direction is pointing is to try and split that into X and Y components. And we're gonna write it as a sum of an X component and a Y component. We're gonna be looking at the two components here where we have the force in the Y direction and the force in the X direction. Now, personally, I think the X direction is a little bit easier to see and understand. So let's redraw our problem this time, though, we're going to extend out the water a little bit further. Black line is still going to be our wall that we're interested in. But of course, the water is going to continue on. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to draw another wall that's vertical over here to the left of our wall. A volume. <clears throat> what this does for us is it helps us define a volume of water that's enclosed between these two walls. If we're looking purely in the X direction and this water isn't moving, then we know that the forces on the left side and the right side have to be equal. So we can have some force in the X that has to be equal to an equal and opposite force on the right. Now this force is negative because really what we care about is the reaction force of the water acting on the wall. And this would be the wall acting on the water. So these forces are equal and opposite. We can take this vertical wall, calculate the force on it, and it will be the same as what we have on our curved wall, specifically in the x direction. Well, we know how to do this. The resultant force in x is just going to be the pressure at the centroid of this wall multiplied by its area. And we can use the formula method again to figure out where that force should actually be located. So we know that the center of pressure is going to be the centroid plus the moment of inertia divided by y bar a. So that takes care of our x component. Our y component looks a little bit different. And we're going to do something similar in that we're going to have that y force pushing upwards. But of course, that's the force of the wall on the water. And we care about the water on the wall. So we have that negative sign there. At the top, this time, there's no pressure. So we know that there's no force on that top surface. We still have static equilibrium. So the sum of the forces is still 0. But now the force that we get is due to the mass of the water and gravity. So if we want the y component of this force, it's going to be just negative mg or negative rho times g times the volume, where that rho times the volume becomes the mass. And I want to go ahead and write out exactly what volume I'm talking about here. This is the volume between the wall that we're interested in and the surface of the water. So for us, that's just the volume of water that's sitting on top of this wall and pushing down on it. As for the location of the force, right, the center of pressure of that force, well, we can find the center of gravity of that volume. And the location of the center of pressure is just going to be exactly the location of that center of gravity. So to sum up, let's look at this picture one more time. And if we've calculated ycp and xcp, then we can pinpoint where that force is located. 
So our force may be located here, and then we can sum our FRx and FRy in the two directions, and we end up with the resultant force, which is a vector. It may be weird seeing the resultant force being off the surface here, but remember that the force can be acting anywhere on the line of action of that force. It may be more appropriate to say that it's acting here, but in terms of the moments that that force provides, uh, it doesn't actually make any difference between those two points. And this is a bit easier to calculate, so we usually just stick with that. So that's everything you need to know. But uh, before we finish, I want to go ahead and look at uh, kind of the inverse problem of what we're looking at here. So let's say we had this same wall, but this time our water is on the other side of the wall. So if we're looking at the x component, that really doesn't change, right? We still have this same equivalent wall that we can draw. And we can still say that the reaction force in the x direction is going to be equal to p bar a. Of course, it's going to be negative now because we're pushing to the left. Our y component should be pushing up. So our reaction force should look something like this. So how do we account for this uh, force in the y direction? Well, it's tempting to use the volume of water. However, that's not what we have defined this volume as. This is the volume between the wall and the surface of the water. So where's the surface of the water? Well, the surface is here. And so the volume that we're interested in is actually the volume between our wall and the surface that we have here. So the way we've drawn it, this volume would have some mass that is gonna be pushing down. But of course, the force on the wall is gonna be pushing up. So whenever you're doing it this way, you need to make sure that the forces and the directions that you choose are going to make sense. So the force in the y direction here is just gonna be rho times g times vol, and that's going to be positive this time because it's going to be pushing up. Now, another way of thinking about this, if we filled up the water on both sides, the force from that water would be equal to zero because the pressure at every single point would be the same on both. And so they just cancel each other out. So the force, if we have water on both sides, is equal to zero. That force both is just equal to the force of the right plus the force of the left. So what happens if we take one side or the other away? Well, if we get rid of the water on the left side of our problem, then the right side is just going to be the force of both sides minus the force of the left side. That goes away. And so the force on the right-hand side is just exactly the opposite of the force on the left. We get that the force on the right-hand side here is going to be a negative p bar a in the i direction plus rho g vol in the j direction. So the big caveat here is to always look at the volume of water above the wall. So that should be everything you need to know to go ahead and get started on some of these problems.